Right. So my agenda today is I want to give you my overall opinions. And then I want to look at some sort of methodologies or some key points which I think are important when determining RTOs. So, so my way of doing it, and I'll take in there a little bit some other people's ways of doing it. I want to talk about this idea of RTOs that can't be met or under certain incidents because um, I don't think you can meet RTOs in all incidents. So how do we deal with that? I also want to look at this concept of zero hours RTOs and do they exist? Do they, um, is there any point doing um, zero hours RTOs? And I'd like to share some thoughts with you around about that thing and then any other information or any other thoughts I had in RTOs that was there as well. And we've got, a, we've got an hour to do this. We hopefully get 45 minutes with some questions. So for me, my opinion is RTO, as it says on the first thing, I think is one of the most important things we do in business continuity. Yeah, we can have plans and we can have all the rest of the stuff. But in the end, business continuity for me is all about if we have a disaster, whatever scale that disaster is, how quickly do we need to recover? But for me, business continuity is all about time. And it's all about to say, actually, what do we need to recover first and what do we need to recover last? It's, all, it's also about incident management, but once we get beyond the kind of, let's have an incident management team, we're really trying to look at what activities, what are our, all the things we do in our organization, what do we need to recover first and what do we need to recover last? And do we need to actually to recover something, do we need to um, do we need to do extract? Can we recover it within our existing resources, which is fine, it doesn't cost us any more money, or do we actually need to actually spend some money or do some activities to make sure that we can recover to our designated time? And if we get the time wrong, then all the bad things that we do when we come onto our max and total period disruption are going to happen. And so we don't want them to happen. So the first thing is say, I think it's the most important thing. I think one of my other opinions or one of my kind of prejudices is trying to reduce the number of RTOs. We in our, I've seen lots and lots of people with hundreds of RTOs when they don't need hundreds of RTOs. And the more you have, the more you need to update and you have this massive beast to keep going and everyone kind of moans and groans, say, oh, we've got to redo our BIA. And actually, if you had less RTOs, you don't need to redo, well, you need to redo your BIA, but at least you just need to review them quickly. And, I, and I'm going to have an argument, I'll talk about an argument about trying to reduce the number of RTOs. To me, another absolutely critical bit is they've got to be realistic. You know, they can't be aspirational. They can't be saying, oh, we'd love to be able to recover in 24 hours. And we put that in our BIA. And some people, I kind of look at people's, um, I, I look at people's uh, recovery time objectives. We do a lot of work for um, a warehouse organization. And all their RTOs are like six hours. And I'm sure they'd love to recover their warehouse in six hours if it burnt down. But we know fine well it's not going to happen. But they kind of sometimes think there must be some sort of magic theories out there going to make it um, magically happen. So we need to be realistic about our RTOs. And I want to have some thoughts on that. And I think there need to be RTOs need to be tied into organizational requirements, which is a little bit obvious, but I think I want to state that. So that's my sort of where I'm coming from before we start. I thought I would put here, because we're all in coronavirus and, and we know and we kind of um, know where we're at, but I thought I'd put in a good old fashioned flood because, um, you know, this is what normally in business continuity we think about floods and fires and blackouts and all those sort of things. So I'll just remind you to say, you know, it's not all coronavirus. And actually, we need to think about what happens if another incident happens at the same time now. How are we going to deal with it? So I just put our, our flood there. So this bit is about determining RTOs. Now, this is a methodology I use. 
um, every lot of people do it differently, but it works for me. And I want to see if it hopefully you can take away something from this or think, oh, that's a, that's an interesting or a, so I'm not saying you need to do my methodology. I'm hoping there's going to be something you're going to take away from it. Um, where do we find RTOs? What are they? So there's the definition which I got off good practice guidelines yesterday. And you say period type on this, which which I think the, the, the first thing is it's you can do them for products and services. You can do them activity level. And also you can do it resources. And one of the sort of typical things we would do is IT recovery of applications and I um, recovery IT is one of the places we'll find it. So um, products and service level, activity level, or IT, or any other um, resources. So you can have other resources as well as IT. So that's where you where you find your RTOs, and that's your definition there. When we go into the organization, one of the things I think we sometimes neglect, and this is taken from the, the new, I think it's the, the 22313, which is the explanation on 22301. And this is how all the activities work together. So we've got the purpose of the organization, which I think I'm gonna come on to a second there. We've got some products and services, we've got a load of activities, and then we've got this, dependencies of sporting activities. So these level here, those five ones along there, could be the kind of operational activities where we deliver our um, products and services to our customers. And then dependencies of supporting activities are the kind of HR and finances which support those activities. And then we have the assets and resources um, which support those. And as we said earlier, we can have RTOs of products and service levels, the activities, supporting activities, and assets and resources level. And determining activities, I normally do them round about the activity level. Um, and I do a bit of process mapping to be able to understand what the different activities are. And usually conceptually mapping activities is not that that difficult so many of you will have different different ways to do it one of the things i think i'm not good at which i'd like to get better is determining more rtos at the products and service level and, and speaking to senior managers about the product and service level and sometimes if you've got tons and tons of products and services it kind of you kind of struggle with it because you might end up with more products and services than actual activities but if you have some high level if you're sort of manufacturing you're manufacturing sort of some goods or you've got um a particularly service you deliver then looking at the products and service level might give you some better you know, if you can say, actually, we want to get this products and services back up in 24 hours, then we can actually look at the activities below that, and that can help us determine what are the activities key to living that product and services, and then we can um, look at how that is delivered. So determining activities, I think conceptually is quite simple. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. We all know, this uh, from Animal Farm. We all know that quote, but we all know, for me, as I said earlier, RTOs are all about priority. So what comes first and what comes last? So we're trying to look at the priority activities. And what we're trying to do here, for me, is to try and look at some sort of scientific is too grandiose way of talking about it. But I think we need to, as far as I can see, I've never met or never seen anywhere that there is a formula or some particular way of determining RTOs apart from sort of gut instincts, experience, common sense, which goes an awful long way. But what I'm going to try and explain here is a kind of methodology which at least has some, I'm not say science, but a kind of a logic to it which can help you if you are out there and you're getting people who 
you know, for lots of particular reasons, different people and organizations might want to over egg the RTOs and they might want to actually get them too tight. And as we know, if they're too tight, they're going to cost us extra money. And you might know in your gut feel say, actually, you know, this guy is asking for six hours, but I know we can quite happily go for two to three days and, you know, that activity is going to happen. So what I want to explain to you is, is a way of looking at having some sort of logic to, to your RTOs. And the first thing I want to have a look at is determining your maximum tolerable period of disruption. And some people struggle with the concept of this, and some they will say, what's the point of it? And I just want to here to have a little bit of a, a diagram here or take you through and see whether the logic of this works for you. So we've got time along the bottom and impact along the top. And my logic goes like this to say for every active, everything we do in business, there is, if we don't do it, that not doing that activity becomes unacceptable to our organization. To say if we don't do HR, if we don't do sales, if we don't do marketing, if we don't do senior manager activities, we don't do production, all of those becomes unacceptable sooner or later. Some becoming unacceptable sooner, some become unacceptable later, but they all become unacceptable. So we've got activity A that comes unacceptable quite quick. Activity two goes a bit longer, and activity C takes a, a bit longer still. And if we say activity C is something like HR, because I always pick on HR, then um, if we don't do HR sooner or later, you know, we wouldn't have any new recruits, we wouldn't have any new new um, staff on board, we would have, we'd have lots of problems with staff issues. So we all need those activities, but some of them have different impacts over time. So if we accept that, if we don't do those activities, we, we can actually start, because what we want in business continuity is to get some granularity. We want to know which ones we want to do first and which ones we want to do last. The problem is that when A cover, crosses that unacceptable line, is it an exact time? So if you say A is, you know, is about reputation, it's about delivery of service, there is some wiggle room and to say, if we don't deliver our service of one or two days, if it's at Christmas and nobody's buying, that time may be extended out. But if it is actually at our, <coughs> Hopefully that's not Corona's cough. Um, if it is at um, if it is at um, our peak time, then that time is going to be quicker. If we worried about an activity which is all about reputation, if we have a massive incident as you're going on at the moment, and we have a reputational issue, maybe people won't see it because they're worried about the massive incident. Where if it's a slow news day, it might come up. It might be more obvious. So in terms of acceptability, it's not an exact time where A crosses the line. So what, what I do when I'm doing my MTPDs is saying, right, actually what we do is some, have some bracketed times. So you can see the bracketed times along the bottom. We know that C goes becomes unacceptable at one month plus. Could be three months, could be four months, could be five months depending on the time, but we know it's in that ballpark. Whereas we know A doesn't become unacceptable in 24 hours, but sometime between, you can see between one and three days, it becomes acceptable. So again, you're seeing we're getting some granularity because we're sorting out our activities to say, you know, if we said the first one was not 24 hours, the second one was two, we get A is, in the column for two, B is in the column for three, C is in the column for five. So we're starting shifting these into, into different columns, into different blocks, and then we can start having a look at, once we get our MTPDs, we can start looking at our RTOs. Now, when we're looking at um, unacceptable, Unacceptable means lots of different things to lots of different organization. 
So if we are the NHS, then what we're, um, what's really important to us is maybe at the bottom of my list, they're likely to lead to death or injury. But if I'm an office-based organization and um, I work nine to five, death or injury doesn't really apply to me. If, if I'm a, an, oil, um, an oil producer, then I could damage the environment. But if I'm in an office, I don't. If I'm um, a, a financial institution, um, legal and regulatory compliance is very important to us, so don't break it. So when we look at that unacceptability line, that MTPD line, what we need to do is to define it a little bit tighter and say, look at the organization and say, what is important to them? Because all those things are important to everything, but you know, we have to kind of try and choose some of them. And normally this is my sort of blank list of all the ones I want to do. And then I pick two or three, maybe even four, or sort of, I probably not two or three, maybe between three and five of what is pertinent to that organization to define unacceptability in their, in their eyes. And what I normally do is, uh, is to get senior managers and I get them to have a look at this and say, look, there's your list, vote on the three you're allowed to have or the five you're allowed to have. And so here's an example here from, this is uh, a courier company. And this is the five we went to there. So you've got customer service, you've got operations. Well, you can, you can re read that too. So when we are doing the unacceptability test and we're looking at all their different activities, these are when things become unacceptable. So I think that one of my points to say earlier is to say, actually, you need to make sure that when you look at unacceptability, you, um, you put it around what the organizations you deal with and what's important to them. Once we've got our maximum probable period of disruption, which if you're a sort of BC officiado, you should be aware of it, then this is the time when that, that impact becomes unacceptable. You can either quantify it, so you could put a, you know, if it's financial, you could put financial amount, and we'll not go into financial amounts, but sometimes that's difficult, or you can kind of say roughly when it becomes unacceptable, when our clients would start if it's customer service, when our clients will start to leave us because they're not getting the customer service. Because it's a bracketed time, it also helps to say, you know, our customers, because our customers would find difficulty finding the service elsewhere, we might be, you know, anything between one and four weeks or even one month plus. So if we keep it kind of, it's not a, it's not a spreadsheet thing, it's a rough time. So that's the maximum probable period disruption. So once we've got our maximum probable period disruption, we know that A becomes, if that's time along the bottom, A becomes unacceptable first, C, C, B, C, and D. So these are when they become unacceptable because we've done this analysis. Then we can start looking at to say, our recovery time objective, what we talked about today, is somewhere between explosion time and A, and we know it's somewhere among that, along that time, and it's got to be shorter than your time. But if you see here, we've already got a sort of logic to say, we've looked at the values of the organization, we've looked at when different activities come in unacceptable, and we've put them in, in some bracketed time. So we've got some kind of good information there of roughly when they want to be. So if you look at C, you can't have C at the same place as A because C is going to come unacceptable in a longer time. So again, if you've got the director at C saying, look, I'm really important, I'm as important as A, we've already got some logic of why C is less time critical. Also, what I, I try and do is get the senior managers to sign off my, um, my values then um, what you can do is to say, well, if you don't like, look, senior managers signed off the values. So if you don't like the values, go and argue with them. Don't argue with me because um, I'm just a messenger here. So it gives you some sort of top cover to be able to 
to, to do this. Now, this is my rule of thirds, which um, not very many people know about, only people who want my training, but I quite like this. So if we take the time between our incident and MTBD, and this is as close as I can get to science um, for determining MT, um, RTOs. So if we take our MTPD as being, say, three weeks to one month, so the lowest time we're going to hit the MTPD is three weeks. That's the first time we do it. We want to determine the RTO. So what I do is divide it up into thirds. So the RTO is somewhere between one week and two weeks. We don't want it at the third close to the MTPD because actually if we put it in that third and we miss the third, then we're going to hit the MTPD. We don't want it in the, the first third because actually we would have to spend more money than we want and we're over recovering. So it's got to be in the middle third. And, and I say to my clients or when I'm teaching this to say, actually, anything between one and two weeks, you can have whatever time you want. Maybe it's a bit more towards the the towards almost up two weeks or whether it's closer to the, the beginning of one week. You know, this is your judgment there, but you can't have two days and you can't have 15 days or you can't have 14 days or whatever. So this allows you to, when you're doing your RTOs, is to put your RTOs in a bracketed time and to have some logic so that you can make sure that your logic ties in the MTPDs. So I commend to you Charlie's um, RTO rule of thirds. Now, one of my bugbears in life, as I said earlier, is the amount of activities. And I'm on a kind of mission to try and cut down people's amount of activities. It's sometimes easier said than done, because I go into BIA workshops thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to really kind of vanquish this because I got 50. And or, you know, I'm going to really tie them down to make sure I didn't get tons of RTOs um, or tons of activities. And then it kind of people just like to have some. But if we look at, say, finance, on the right there is some of the possible activities you could have within finance. So that happened to be a big finance department. We've got some RTOs there. And they go from payroll, which, you know, you might need to do 24 hours to report in the city, or you've got strategic planning, financial planning, um, one month. And typically, if you're doing a BIA, and I see this very often, is you can have whatever that is, seven activities. My trying to push this idea is say, why not have one activity as finance as habit as 24 hours? You then rely on the finance people because you're going to have as part of your RTO or as part of your BIA, you're going to have your build finance build up over time. So you're going to let them have two people for two people in 24 hours to do this payroll. And then you might be, you know, you might need 10 people for accounts payable and invoicing, and you're going to build that up over time. But instead of breaking the finance down to all its component bits, why don't you just call the activity finance and then let the finance people decide upon which of those activities on the right do they want to do within which time? So they've got their build up of time over, they got their build up of time. What you're going to do is get up to finance and say, look, you can have numbers over time. What you do with those numbers. I'm going to leave up to you. So if it's, you know, if it's not towards payroll and you've got two people in 24 hours, well, let gets them doing a bit of accounts payable. Or actually, if it's going to reporting to the city and it's coming up soon, let's get the reporting of the city. So what you're doing is you're giving the department more flexibility to decide on which activities they do, rather than they're saying very generally, no, you know, We've got a pen, we've got to recover payroll, and then we've got a problem actually in reporting to the city. And they're giving themselves kind of, they're tying their options down. Well, if you say finance, right, you've got, you've just got a numbers over time. How you want to organize that is really up to you. 
So what I would say to you is have a think about, can you roll up your activities? Can you roll up your HR activities? Can you roll up some of your operational activities? And then just leave it up to then which activity within the finance department they want to do on the day. So that's a little bit about how many activities. A little bit of debate about when the start time is RTOs, because normally, you know, RTOs for me should be measured when you had the disaster, my ziggy zaggy thing there, to 24 hours. So 24 hours is the 24 hours should start as soon as the incident happens, or you could say it comes down to when the in, when you sort of reach zero capability. So your capability may take a little bit of time, but then your RTO is measured from either the incident or capability, and my, my line there before the RTO is recognizing that there are some activities that need to be done to hit an RTO so that you might need to bus people to your recovery center, you might need to set up the recovery center, you might need to brief them, you need to get them on the desk, you need to get them to fire up their computers, they need to make sure they can log on. All that sort of stuff has to happen before the 24 hours happens. So there's quite a lot of activities there. So for me, very much is the 24 hours RTO is the time at which a capability is delivered. So that's the RTO. There can be some debate if it takes you a little bit of a while to, maybe it's happened on a Friday or Friday night, and you haven't recognized that there is an incident, then does it ha does your 24 hour start for when you recognize the incident or the incident happened? So I think with RTOs, there are kind of a little bit of debate of quite when they when they start. So I think for your organization, you need to be sort of clear in your own mind is when is an RTO start? When, when are you starting the clock? And also in your RTO is what does the actual RTO look like and what is the capability you're delivering that? Um, and that's sometimes talked about the uh, maximum business continuity objective and trying to deliver a capability there. So we can maybe do that for, for, another, for another, another webinar. But um, so determining what that capability is capability it is, is quite important so that you can understand what you are actually delivering at your RTO. Um, let's talk about meeting your RTO, and I put there a blackout picture just to remind us of power cuts. One of the big problems you have is, I alluded to earlier, is about um, RTO gaps. I have seen 101 RTOs for lots of different people, which I know fine well that they can't be met. And for me, you know, this, this thing is, I know you can achieve 24 hours, but you can't achieve, I can achieve 48 hours, but you can't achieve 24 hours. And the classic case is I was doing some work for um, a company that did couriers, and basically they had a job with the banks to move paperwork for them. And the bank set the RTO at 24 hours to say, you must have this activity up at 24 hours. It sat at 24 hours, bank asked the organization, can you meet 24 hours? They said yes, and everyone was happy. We then went and did a proper BIA and said, actually, how would we actually deliver this capability? What, what would we need to do? And the only way to do it was that they would have to go and buy in some racks. This was impossible to do without a set of racks um, with a whole load of pigeonholes. So because this thing, this sorting was done by hand. Now, the company went away and said, right, how quickly do we need? How quickly can we get some racks? And they said four days. We can't get it quicker than four days. So then they had to go back to the bank and said, look, 24 hours we were talking about for to meet your requirement at 24 hours 
we will need to purchase and have on standby another location, a set of racks, which is going to cost 20,000 quid. If you don't want to have a, a set of racks for 20,000 quid, we can purchase and set it up in four days. The bank came back and said, we'll, we'll change the RTO for four days. But for me, that's a classic example of unachievable RTOs. And if we have a lot of RTOs is about delivery, is about having the underlying IT systems, I think we've got to be brutally honest and say, it, what is our RTO at the moment? And we have that as the RTO until we can hit a desired. Or we've got a two-column RTO in our plans that say, this is the desired one, but this is the achievable. Because for me, I think if you have a whole time of under, if you have business continuity plans and they're audited and everyone loves them, you have a big disaster and you don't hit your RTOs and there's an investigation afterwards, then people will say, well, look, you put an RTO for that activity 24 hours, you didn't deliver that capability and you said you did because we audited your plans and you said that was fine. Um, you knew fine well that that RTO would not be met, but you still kept with it. So is this dishonesty or is this, does this mean all your other BC is absolutely rubbish because you can't meet your RTRs? So we are going to sue you or take you to task because you've been dishonest in your recovery. So I think this idea of achievable RTOs and desirable RTOs, I think we have to be honest with our sales and honest with our clients and honest with our suppliers and honest with our customers and say, look, this is, this is what we can do at the moment with our existing capabilities. This is what we'd like to do, but there is a gap and acknowledge that gap. So go forth and look at your, go forth, um, go, go and have a look at your RTOs and see whether they're achievable. I think you also have to have a look at to say what on what scenario is your RTOs achievable? Because you know, for building loss, IT loss, yeah, they might be achievable. But are you in this pandemic hitting your RTOs? Um, if you lost, if you had the jumbo jet landing on your on your you know 9/11 type incident where you lose a lot of staff, is that is that possible? In a widespread power cut, which goes off for several days, which could go across the whole country, can you achieve your RTOs? And actually, do you have the customers so that they can't achieve that? Telecoms fairly really ransomware. So I think one of the other things is you need to slightly determine to say, actually, what scenarios are you going to be able to hit your RTOs? And be honest in which scenarios we're just not going to be able to hit our RTOs. And it could be your, you know, if you have a mass flooding event, your if your customers are local, you've got no demand. So it doesn't actually matter if you don't meet your RTOs because there is no demand. So again, think about your RTOs is what are under what circumstances can you meet them and maybe document what circumstances can't you meet them. I think this is an interesting concept is zero hours RTOs. And this ties in with the idea of being honest. So we did um, the, the, the BC of um, National Airport in the Middle East. And it is their one major international airport. And they had three, I think, scanners. And basically, you can't run you can't let anyone on a plane unless it's been properly scanned you're likely to be properly scanned and under under airport rules you can't do it manually you've got to use scanners so no scanners no fly basically and basically we were looking at the rto of the scanners because the fact is that what are you what scenario are you looking at are you looking at them breaking down where you say actually do I want an RTO of naught hours? Because basically they're broken down. Hopefully they're only one at a time. So, but if there was a fault that went across three, you would fix them. So you have your RTO as naught, and I'll come on to RTO as naught. Do you have a two hour RTO which says, actually, we have a local company that has an SLA, we'll send you an engineer along to trundle along, and he or she is on that we'll fix them in two hours so that should be the longest we should have to wait but if the part is not there 
or there is a fire or a flood or something else happens in the in the area that the the scanners are then actually if the if they were to burn down and they were damaged beyond repair then it would take a month or two months to get new ones so in terms of realistic um rtos what do you set them at and this is what i came in with this idea of no rtos and here's a cement plant and in the middle of the cement plant you can see a cylindrical thing there and that is their kiln and basically that cooks various chemicals including limestone and makes cement but that is the heart of the process so if that breaks then you lost the process now to get a new one would probably take six months because they have to be fabricated they're massive things you know they're huge they're several hundred several tons and with and you know that people don't keep them off the shelf to be made to order so there is so basically what is the point of having can you put an rto on that bit or is it meaningless and and, and there is a certain amount of activities where you have one of them where you're basically i think the idea is an all rto and it doesn't mean you can fix it at all it says that our fix will take as long as it takes to fix you know we can't depending on the incident it could be major minor and we can sort it or it could be absolutely major and actually take six months to fix so actually one of one of these cement plants got um got inundated by water and it took eight months to fix now i don't know what his rto was but you know so you know things like sound silicon wafer fabrication that is where you know the silicon wafer fabricator costs 70 million pounds a time you as a company are not going to have an awful lot of them so you might just have one and so how quickly can you get yours up yes there's a possibility of you can outsource it to someone else but that might take time You've got manufacturing where if you manufacture something particularly specialist you can't manufacture it to anybody else nobody else does it and all you've got to do with your manufacturing is to say there is no good time to fix it there's no kind of sweet spot to say well if we do it and we do it within two two hours that'll be okay you know you want to get it back up and going as quickly as possible and if you work 24 7 a sort of slightly full capacity every downtime cost it costs you lots of money there's um defense manufacturing you your defense your item defense items are actually tied to geographical location of the factory so you can't do that manufacturing anywhere else so actually you know you have to try and fix it and things like data centers so if you're a data center company and your data center burns down then again what's the rto for a burnt down data center well you know six months a year is that worth doing or if your data center goes down you know you try and fix this as quick as possible they got the blackberry out outages you know that is where all the blackberry machines went down in 2012 and again what is the rto for fixing it you know you can have a nice number but is the number meaningful does it add value does it take you somewhere or do you just have to be accept that we'll try and put as much resilience as here's some ideas of what we can do. We can put in as much increased resilience. We can try and make this as in inverted commas bomb proof as possible. But in the end, we know we got a single point of failure and we will hope it doesn't happen. But if it does happen, we'll recover as quickly as we can. But there is no set time for recovery. Um, just a couple more bits and RTOs because no time it's rolling on here. Um, some of the difficulty RTOs we have in activities are things like communications and IT, emergency planning, business continuity teams, where the teams have two roles like communications, internal communications they have their routine communications where they write the company magazine and they they do the website and also the 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 
um, intranet and they do all those activities. So an actual in, you know, in a disaster, we don't need routine communications. We don't need the company magazine, but we do need internal comms to respond to an incident. So the way I kind of get around this in terms of RTOs, I split them into two activities, and you can do this for a number of departments, is to say your routine communications could be one month plus, but your response to the incident is maybe an hour. So this is saying to comms, you might have two people in comms to say, actually, all your routine stuff will be put to the back of the queue, but actually, I do want you in an hour there responding to the incident. And that's again with IT, because IT do lots of different things in development, they do patching, they help their response fix. You might again do some of the IT activities like development, you might say, right, actually that's got an RTO of six weeks, two months, but actually the response and fix, I need that within um, an hour. And the same with our business continuity, you know, your normal business continuity activities, you're going to leave that for a bit longer, but you actually want your business continuity to respond. So that's one of the difficulties I kind of face with, with, with RTOs is how you do business continuities or um, internal comms, external comms, defining their, their, their RTOs. And I think, if if we come back back to in the sort of conclusion there, you've seen those things. So hopefully covered. Extremely important. Try and reduce them. Got to be realistic. And tied into the requirements. That's where we have the values there. I think we've also got to go and say that. In many cases, RTOs and approximation. In certain circumstances, yes, we can say we can hit the 24 hours if we set 24 hours. But sometimes we are going to admit to say, actually, it is a bit of approximation. If we can get them quicker, let's get them up and quicker. Let's not wait for 24 hours. Sometimes a recovery of IT can be a bit more binary because you can say, actually, yeah, we've recovered it or not recovered it within the existing time. But under certain circumstances, they're going to be an approximation. They're going to be a kind of, this is a rough planning time, but on certain circumstances, we're not going to hit it in every single circumstances. And if we go for the, the no RTOs, then we need to actually say, you know, we'll fix as quick as we can, you know, and every minute, uh, Every minute of downtime is bad. And do we have an MTPD on um, zero RTOs? I'm not quite sure. Maybe we do, but can we actually, if we know that we're going to go out in business in three weeks, does that help? Or well, perhaps it does, but hopefully we focus our thoughts on recovering and we'll recover as long as it takes. So I think sometimes an approximation, and I think I want to sort of. Um, push you the importance of RTO and the importance of thinking thinking through the RTOs. So thank you. Any questions? I did 50 minutes. So any questions on that or any thoughts or comments or anything else you would like to say? Um, I've just seen your, your Mark Cardman things there. So, although we differ from organization dogs when we, when you say you should try and reduce the number of RTOs, is there a detailed number of RTOs we should aim for? You see, I think it's interesting that I try and, I like 20. I think 20 for me is a bit the magic number. And for, for many organizations, especially if you're a massive organization, if you're like a lawyer, international lawyers, when you have organizations that do the same thing in lots of places, then it's quite easy to kind of reduce the number of RTOs because if you have HR in Hong Kong, is that any different for HR in UK or you have lawyer delivery or delivery of lawyery stuff in, you know, should that be actually the same everywhere? 
I think the one place where I find massive amounts of activities is when you get into the local authority, because the local authority do such a multitude of different things. But on the whole, I like I like to see if we can get it 20. Um, and then the RTO should reflect that vote. Should the MT be influenced by the large the RTO? So rather than setting RTO, that should in, in fact they understand the RTO and then the approximate length of determining. Yeah, I think it is for for me that the MTPD just helps you park the RTO in the right ballpark. It it says it's round about a day, it's round about 24 hours, it's round about an hour or what it is. I think once you've got your RTOs, I think you have to submit them to the to the senior executives and they've got to sign them off. I think almost after that, yes, it's useful to have the MTPDs, but I think the RTOs are the critical bits and get that signed off. The MTPD, I think, is almost like a sort of planning thing that we use and then we and then we kind of um and then we can kind of keep our mind's eye on it on in a disaster when you have an incident when you deploy. But I think your your RTO may move depending on the disaster. So um, I wouldn't go back and change them. I'll, I'll go you says there. Do you do the RTO MTPDs? I presume can be defined and viewed after counting a desktop exercise or back of the real incident. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Is I think RTOs. Yes, you could go and say, actually, we, we coped with this a bit longer than we actually thought, and it didn't have some big impacts. I think that's kind of fairly typical, then we can push out the RTOs. Yeah, I think that's, I think it is worth reviewing them. The only problem I see is a little bit is that it could be round about the circumstance of that particular incident. So kind of, if if that incident is um it, it there might have been some particular reasons why you got away with a longer RTO and you're still here, but actually if the incident was different, you might have had a shorter RTO. So I think it's worth reviewing, but I think you have to kind of look at your original logic and did your original logic hold hold true or was the were actually your original logic long? That's why it's useful to have some um useful to have some thought useful to have a review there let's do the other mark one them i can either should we should try and roll out the activities as possible take the finance and producing it by juicing them all to a single tab this potentially lead to some internal fusion to what should they should focus on isn't there any plan to allow someone to pick it up know what they should consider to do i think yes my only my only issue with that is to say if you are uh mr or mrs finance director do you need me, who's had an hour interview with you, to tell you what your priorities are? Does uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, finance, or Ms. Um, finance, should they not know that? So why does it take me to tell them? So I think, you know, they are the people with the internal knowledge to say, you know, yeah, look, actually payroll's coming up or reporting to the city, or we really need to get these figures out because if we don't get these figures out, there might be something happening in finance. We're you know, trying to get a multi-billion pound loan and actually we're not going to get it if we don't get these figures out. So I need to focus some of the people on this and not that. So I think it is, I think it is by rolling out the activities, it gives more flexibility to the finance person to be able to decide upon their priorities rather than you know imposing them in advance when we don't quite know the circumstances or you know we've always got seasonal variation which you haven't talked about so that's always going to be an element of say actually we need to might need to change around that um activity oh look we've got that um, uh, no say how often do you test RTOs? Good question like that. I think it's part of the RTOs. You know, they say you should test your test each plan annually. I think, you know, if you've got an RTO for going to work here recovery, let's get a test of see if we can hit that RTO. Maybe if your IT RTOs, you want to do them a bit quicker. So I think annually, 
And the thing is, what you might want to do is to say, you know, you might want to have an exercise program and you say, if you go to work area recovery, you might want to, um, you know, practice the IT year one. You might want to practice some of the busing and the activities there. And so you're practicing the people type elements. On the third year, you might to do more sort of live exercise, bring them all together, practice it all together. So I think, I think, it slightly depends, but I think you need to be able to say, if I put this number in, you need to almost reverse engineer and say, how can I prove this is going to work? Um, and then you can say, well, what do I need to do to do that? And how do I need to take into account the business changes? And that might determine how often and how you test it. Um, Lena here, as the third party, what's the key to testing of the third party suppliers? You see, you can look at you can look at it, you can look at their exercises, but it's sometimes you had to believe them. I think it's almost maybe like a, a for third party suppliers, you do an interview. It's a bit like a I sometimes always think if it's a really critical supplier, it might be like a job interview when you actually have to say, well, actually get him in and say, look. Talk me through this RTO, talk me through how you're going to meet it, because this is really important to me, and it's really important to this contract we want to sign. Talk me how you're going to do it. And I think you'll very quickly, if you've got a little bit of knowledge, you'll catch out whether they're bluffing or not. Because it's quite hard to it's quite hard to kind of bluff these things. You can yeah, you bluff on a piece of paper, say 24 hours, but actually when you say, Well, tell me how you're going to deliver it, tell me what circumstances, I think a bit of an interview there might help. Um, Neil, let's have you used um, BPA maps to define dependencies and define the activities? Yes, dependencies. Yes, you need to map the dependencies. I kind of sometimes a little bit struggle with this. Is to say, yes, of course you need to understand the dependencies and you need to understand you know, your resource dependencies. You also need to understand your sort of upstream dependencies and then those who you're doing your dependencies too. Sometimes the only reason I'm saying, I'm saying a little bit vague about that, sometimes I sort of struggle with this kind of, does it get so complicated and so, you know, modeling? And is the, with all kind of modeling, we've seen coronavirus is only as good as the data and then the data is only good as, as good as the actual way you've collected it. And, you know, BCP is you can you can get a whole load of different people collecting a whole load of different data in different ways. You know, software is quite good at understanding all those dependencies. But I think you can look at some of the most sort of critical dependency. You go and say, look, I'm dependent on them. They're going home for a week and I need them to be home. I need them up and going in 48 hours. So I think you can do this. I think it's my, my struggle a little bit with dependencies is the obvious ones is fine. But I don't think if you're trying to fine tune it too much, then I think you, you, you might struggle with it being meaningful. I think we're up to just a minute left. I think, um, Lachlan, do you want to finish that off? Um, you can find yeah, me on the internet, I think, LinkedIn, I think, and everything else. So if you have any questions, give us a shout. Email me, and I'll do that. I'll come back to you. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, much appreciated. I've enjoyed that. Um, makes a little break from the uh, from the normality, which is currently homeschooling my kids at the same time. So I enjoyed that a lot. Um, we've got uh, we've run out run over our, our hour, so I thought I'd just say thank you very much. Uh, great first session. Thank you for all those that, to all those that attended, listened in, and asked questions. You'll receive a recording of the webinar later today via email, in case you missed out on any of the content covered. And if you have any feedback on this webinar, webinar and or any future or topics that you'd like to be future uh, covered in future webinars, just reply to any of the emails that you've received from us. We're trying to do uh, webinars daily. Uh, the next one is scheduled in for Friday, but if, if we can have one for tomorrow, we'll email you out. Otherwise, we'll see you at 10 a.m. on Friday, ready for the next session. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for attending.